Well, my entire career has been in international development, and I've worked with a lot of leaders over the years. I've been involved with uh, G20 uh, finance ministers, and I've been involved with other figures such as Prince El Hassan of Jordan and uh, Tony Blair, and I was involved with Gordon Brown and also um, Nicolas Sarkozy. So these are all people who have helped to shape some of my views about what I think may be lying ahead in terms of the uh, global political and economic situation. Things that are organizing crowds are platforms and the governance and the organization of those platforms is still critical. So I'm going to just leave one example. Huffington Post is a great example. I was meeting one of their writers. Huffington Post was entirely built, 99% of it was built by bloggers, people contributing to knowledge and news comments, yet it was sold for 300 and odd million dollars to AOL. Now, the running joke is you can sell anything to AOL. But once you get past the joke, you start to see, well, actually, the governance and ownership of the commons was entirely 19th century. It was an industrial model. And unfortunately, there's a litigation suit going on with various other things. But it suddenly started to show that kind of the operation had moved into a 21st century model, but the ownership and governance was still locked into a 19th century corporate model. And for me, that starts to throw up huge questions about how do we build the platforms of the near future? We're shifting into a platform economy, an economy which is increasingly going to be built on these platforms which allow micro-massive interactions, all of us to interact in what hugely complex, hugely organic ways. And for me, that's a really potent conversation and practical conversation for me, because the hub is a platform, one of the founders, and I have a real question about my power uh, my power is entirely soft, so in, in the designing of it, in the biasing of seeding of it. So power has increasingly become less and less about management. That's the old model. The new model is in the behavioral nudges I can design in a system. What I mean by that, who are the, tw by inviting James and George inviting James, right, that's a bias. So I can seed the conversation by changing the nature of space by branding it, by bringing people together. I bias it through soft mechanisms, invisible mechanisms. Power has increasingly become invisible. How do I govern? How do I make myself transparent when the power is so embedded into a system? And for me, those are some of the questions that I'd love to bring. I, I, I would suggest that we uh, open this up uh, after James has spoken to actually a group conversation. That's why I think we're nicely formatted. But those are some of the provocations, and please, please feel free to bring others. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to hand over to James, who uh, I'm delighted to have mm -hmm. here. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is the sixth of 12 seminars that I'm giving in consecutive days. And I must say, frankly, that your opening remarks are the most exciting things I've heard since I've been here. And I've heard a lot of exciting things. So, uh, you know, you, you've just nailed it. And, uh, and I think that this is a great way of having a really wonderful morning uh, in conversation. And uh, I think my role right now would just be to uh, define the commons a little bit so you're, you're, you're quite uh, aware of what it is, and also to, um, in, in the course of, this, of the discussion that ensues, to try to link you know, the, the potentiality of crowdfunding in discovering the commons in a brand new way. Because as you said, what's happening is the, the technology is allowing us, the new technology is allowing us to discover things about ourselves that we had already, already known historically, but now we're, we're really beginning to practice. Interdependence, sharing, uh, cooperation, mutual collaboration. These are exciting new avenues that are, are bringing people together in, in profound new ways. And it's creating value. 
but that value is still seen within the old system. And, and it's trying to be quantified through the old system. So there's, there's mixed motives, there's confusion, um, there's a recognition that this, that this new technology is inexorable, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and it's also leading to, to new sources of self-organization that we've never had before, it's wonderful. And <clears throat> what happened was, about 15 years ago or so, as a lot of uh, people were uh, really exploring the meaning of open source software and saying, this is, this is profoundly different, this is new. And other people came along and said, well, it's not new because that's what the people on the commons have been talking about for a long time. And it goes back to the literature that Eleanor Ostrom and many others in the commons movement have been developing, which is that all commons represent, I mean, many different principles involved, but just these two basic concepts are key. One is it's a self-organizing unit which comes together m matching the people and, the, and their resources and the relationship of people to their resources. So it's self-organizing and it's also norm-based or rules-based. Users of resources, consumers, uh, need to become the producers of their own resources. And that's why empowering people to become the investors in the management and co-production of different kinds of commons seems to be, along the lines of cooperatives particularly, uh, the way to go. And it, I, I agree, it is the trend of the future because, um, because that's where horizontal decision making is leading us, away from the top-down structure. I would like to see more of really the processes uh, favorable to the formation of a collective will for the sustainability of this work. Because right now they manifest uh, their participation in the collective will by, uh, by their wallet, by donating money. But I don't think that that should be the, the only way. So we need, to, we need to find ways in which uh, the co-creative and the collective intelligence of all people involved uh, can manifest in participating uh, in the creation and governance of the resources which will be the knowledge base, the knowledge system that we are creating. So that needs to be linked with the crowdfunding process. Yeah, right. Shall we? Yeah, uh, it was just a comment on that. Have you looked at, um, there's another website, crowdfunding website called People Fund It? I, no, I didn't see it. I help set it up and it means you can initially you crowdfund for funds and then all of the people who've been involved also donate their time and skills so that you have that more uh -huh. collective, yeah, you develop the social capital, I guess. What, what's it called? People Fund It. People Fund It. Thank you. Wait, what's the website? People Fund It. And um, PeopleFund.it. <laughs> but an A, I think, yeah, that's a stupid name. <laughs> I mean, th th there are some interesting questions in there because most of crowdfunding, I think the stats are 70% of crowdfunding is friends and family. So, mm. uh, so actually, most of the there is no crowd. It's yeah. just really friends and family. And then the next 30%, and I use the term, it is pretty much all of the rest, is friends of friends and family. And then there's about 0.1 that goes viral, mm -hmm. where it really genuinely becomes crowd. So, i.e., more than three degrees of separation. So, sort of typical analysis. So. Th this isn't this isn't genuinely a crowd. It is a social process, uh, almost a social territory process, where you can map the the follow throughs. So that's one thing. I think I think what you're doing is really really right. I think most of crowdfunding is still, uh, what is it, individuals to to the to the perspective to the issue. So there's very little socialization of the crowd, and I think that's probably going to be the next generation of behaviour. I think the mixed mode of capital investment. I think uh, so whether people can invest time, uh, other resources. I mean, uh, Jim Dyer's work in, in Seattle really picked up that some of this stuff using matching funds. So we're going to see some of those innovations coming through. People will put in matching funds. We know Birmingham City Council is looking at a, a matching fund story. So they'll match what the crowd puts in for civic investment. Uh, we know that actually mixed mode uh, resources. Uh, so Jim Dyer's work, uh, Seattle would put in 50% uh, on the basis of the resources and the time that the community put in. So the, and they raised, uh, you know, uh, something like nearly seventy million dollars through that process. So people were investing in their in their places, in their commons, in their local geography, in that way. So these things are still coming. 
I think Indiegogo is a private uh, is a private company. We know the co-founders; they're good people. Uh, Perry Chen is a good person, but they are private companies still. And I think, no, th and that's a really interesting for me where it gets more and more intriguing uh, is what should platforms be built on? And I think more and more I've come to the conclusion that platforms should be CICs, mm. uh, community interest companies. So the asset should be locked. There should be a profit motive. I have no problem with profit motives. Profits are in fact much better than uh, debt, and the profits are much better than uh, wages. Frankly, burning. yeah, oh yeah, but but they should be not profiteering. And we mm -hmm. too often confuse profit with profiteering, economic rent, and monop uh, monopolization. Mm -hmm. And we've allowed that language to sort of get away with itself. Uh, and I think it's equally problematic. So profit is basically the fair return on risk and capital. And I think I have no issue with this. What I do have an issue is when you have monopolization or profiteering, which is effect effectively excessively driving a market to the point of destruction, where uh, but capital asset locks and CICs and other models can deliver that. Mm. I also think we should genuinely look at cooperatives, uh, a real look at cooperatives. I think they are, uh, community benefit societies are incredibly powerful vehicles uh, for fundraising. I mean, I'll give you a really clear example, uh, and we're looking at this. If I wanted to raise capital, uh, cooperatives are very powerful. I don't need to do an IPO, I don't need to spend 40,000 pounds or 70,000 pounds raising uh, going to a, a formal IPO using the FSA, I can actually raise money using it. It can be a not-for-profit, i.e. it can be a charitable organization. I can give return on the capital. I can do all of that stuff. I can give return on capital. I can be a charitable organization. I can benefit in all those ways. I can have an asset lock in that mechanism. I can, all of that stuff can be done, and I don't have the transaction costs of a typical IPO of raising money. So I, I think when you meet this data culture with the cooperative, and the open social methods so anyone can carry on investing if we want to, that method. And we can just reduce the price return on capital if we have excessive amount of investment. So that's the way you control the market. Those mar that is going to be a revolution. Once, you know, once another 20 years goes by, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be profound, uh, the transformation that takes place as a result of the, the kinds of structures that we're setting up right now. So. Um, that's yeah. I, and I think one of the things for me is that one of the transaction costs that was limiting this technology was the cost of sharing. So the cost of sharing was and the scale and the limits, the, uh, the kind of the trust limits of sharing, were actually one of the key things this technology is opening up. So better means, some of you may have heard of better means. It's an open source governance infrastructure. I think it's a beginning. It's kind of a poem of the future. So all these things are actually reducing the cost of sharing. I think one of the big things you hear anyone talk about the sharing economy, and most sharing economies, by the way, that's the other thing, most sharing economies aren't sharing economies, they're just rent. You know, if a corporate lends you their car, it's called rent, right? Uh, sharing is effectively a peer to citizen to citizen model, and I think we must be careful not to confuse the two, because there is a little bit of obfuscation going on uh, designed with the market. But the cost of sharing is going down because of actually the digital infrastructure, and new trust mechanisms are being built. So new trust, uh, and they're going to allow us to scale transactions and scale uh, sharing in a way that's historically not been possible. And this is where economies of scope and economies of scale will start to intersect in a way that's not been dreamed. And for me, that's where we're in a re rather remarkable place. Yeah, yeah. And I, what I would say is that uh, the trust that we need to invest in um, are able to cap a resource. In other words, the, they, they have to preserve equity into the future, and that's the main reason for trust, because markets, the, the, the marketplace, is, the traditional marketplace and the state are not going to preserve um, this equity into the future. Somebody's got to be able to do that. That's the express purpose of setting up legal and fiduciary entities of trusts. And then, um, and then business can still operate pretty much the same way it still does, and we want it to, we want entrepreneurship, we want to encourage profits and not profiteering. We want to be able to, to have that structure still in place. We don't want to rattle the cages, but we want to say that there's got to be a new way of moving from ownership into trusteeship so that the trusts start to create a new dynamic and the state continues to operate because uh, obviously it, it provides essential services that we all need and yet it's been captured by the marketplace in recent years. 
And therefore, we've got to be able to create a, a different dynamic. And the trusts provide that different dynamic. So now instead of this polarization between state and business, which captures all the political headlines and it captures all the imagination of people to say, well, the, what, you know, the real debate is whether the state should be more involved in the marketplace or less involved in the marketplace. And that's we spend all our time looking at that. And we don't recognize that the real issue is the preservation of the commons, which can only be guaranteed by the trust. So in that sense, it seems like the open source model, for me, has really come down to the traditional lessons that we've learned from the commons, as well as the, the, the new, um, mod, the new um, recognition that we've, we're getting from, um, from the, the social media and social technology that's been developing. The co-governance and co-production are the uh, fundamental principles and leading us to a greater understanding of how to sustain resources well into the future. So let's, let's play with this a little bit. If I was to introduce the crowd here, right, I was, just as controversially, the state has a five-year democratic cycle, five-year government cycle. This, unfortunately, has been reduced to pretty much a quarterly cycle. Yeah. This is supposed to be intergenerational, let's put it right. at that year. Yeah. This is instantaneous, the multitude, yeah. right? So, uh, instant, instant Perfect. Down. if we put time cycles around this, yeah. it becomes really interesting. So. How do we deal with this here, positively? Like, how do we design governance mechanisms which talk about intergenerational relationships? Because that's one of the philosophical things. The crowd, I mean, most of the crowd infrastructure is instantaneous, so we have instant governance structures, and that's where the web has been fantastic. What I haven't been able to solve is, what do we talk, how do we deal with 200-year intergenerational thinking? Mm -hmm. How do we start to rebuild the long now? Because, I mean, basically, private interest and state interest, so if you say put private up there and public up here, if these were looking at a 200-year cycle, they converge. They become one, because they can't be differentiated over long enough. Over different segments of cycles, they're diverging. Yeah. So how do we talk, how do we build long value cycles? Well, it's a... Um, or governance. It's, it's a matter that, in, in, it's why I'm here today, yeah. because, because Crowdfunding is thinking along the lines of financial models, and uh, the, the commons movement is thinking along the lines of governance structures for the resources. The two things have to be able to come together. And, and that's why um, these two principles are, are uh, two sides of the same coin, because it, you know when you think about it, obviously, way back when our ancestors saw governance that emerged into the state, production were moved into the market, we're recapturing these ideals and we're bringing them into the, the new definition. But you know, we're not doing that much that's different from the past and yet at the same time we're doing something that's profoundly different than in the past because we're changing the model that that operated under. So how do we, how do we generate these trusts and, and, and talk about the decision making for those trusts? It's, it's the crowd that has to recognize, the multitude has to recognize that um, that not only does it um, make sense to, to look at finance, but it also makes sense to look at the governance models. And it does so by really getting down to political accountability structures um, based on subsidiarity, <coughs> making decisions at the lowest possible level, um, checks and balances, uh, pluralism, polycentrism, decentralization, and um, you know the kinds of things that take us away from the centralized models and guarantee maximum empowerment for people at local levels so that they can begin to um, create the transparency that's necessary for these political accountability structures. Because this, this thing is going to be very controversial. The trusts that we know now are going to transform. They're not going to look like trusts, but we, we need to keep that word even though it, it may create some suspicion, because the suspicion now is, okay, but who is behind those trusts? Who's making all the decisions? And if the decisions are being made in the same way that they have been before, then, and then we're not gonna support that because it, you know, we've had a checkered history over the last several thousand years of, of uh, people uh, having new ideas and then trying to take over and then uh, it ending up just like the old system. So this is different. This is 
this is a this is a model now that now that we've globalized, now that we can really project into the future, and now that the pressure of global warming and other uh, international um, dysfunctions are really bearing down on us, there's a maximum buy-in that we've never had before about the long-term sustainability of the planet, and in fact it's opening up a space where we can really begin to say the multitude now has a collective interest and that's why I say it's a collective interest in sustainability because because what we're getting from the marketplace is individual intentions for sustainability through your consumption rate you know raising the price of petrol to you know mitigate uh, global warming which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it or state regulations to to do the same thing which is not going to work and it's, it's the multitude in the moment who makes these decisions that actually empower them to create the representatives of these trusts. In other words, the, uh, the, the, the maximum multi-stakeholder possibilities of managing individual resources across the planet, from the atmosphere to the rivers to, to technology to, um, you know, to, to pockets within the technology, to culture, to the arts, to education, to healthcare, uh, across the, to water privatization, um, the, the issues are, 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 are vast in terms of what needs to have a, a co-governance and co-production structure to be able to invest in. Trusts need to be able to manage each of those structures in a way that the market and the state can't do. And what guarantees that we do have these targets for the future is the trusts are able to put a cap on these resources for their sustainability. And what's what is beyond the cap then is, is able to be utilized by business and then the, the whole process takes over at that point. So, you know, the, the governance questions are very, very necessary because we've got to decide who are the, uh, the how are the, are, what creates maximum transparency within these trusts because otherwise people will have this political uh, suspicion. So currently I think, I mean, I, I describe our civilization as having the reach of a child we can globally reach but the eye is not to see what we touch. So we can, you know, we can impact. My mobile phone impacts all over the world. I can have it, but I can't be conscious of it. And the last 10, 15 years has really been, been also about the internet and various other things. has been about growing our individual consciousness, the feedback mechanisms for our awareness. So unless we can build the feedback mechanisms of the impact of the crowd, actually, at, this is not still not possible. So we're in a, st I think, that's where I think there's an intermediary move, which is, how do we start to build individual feedbacks of our footprints, of our existence on the planet, where the individual consciousness has risen to actually be global enough? I mean, if you, uh, if you speak to, I mean, sort of Buddhist friends of mine, they would, they would have sort of said, you know, uh, there's a really great example where they sit around and say, uh, you, you have to be able to sit on top of a mountain and see the, uh, feel the winds from all four corners. And what they're trying to talk about there is actually a global consciousness, global consciousness of your presence in the world whilst being firmly rooted at one point. Now, in a sense, we have to do that same rebirth using technology and new, new feedback mechanisms. So, I mean, lots of things are going to start doing this, personalized news, personalized learning, trust infrastructures. I think we're some way from there to there. Like, I think, um, you know, the best, the most amazing technology for the next five years will be basically a shareable trust infrastructure, a personal referential trust infrastructure. So the level of how you validate me and I validate you, the voucher infrastructure, Building that global voucher infrastructure will probably be one of the biggest revolutions we can do because it allows us to scale transactions in a way that's never been possible and our personal footprint. So I suppose I'm saying there's, there's still a journey here. Mm -hmm. And I think we're quite far away. We, we started the first step. What do you think the key steps are mm -hmm. in terms of taking us from there to there mm -hmm. um, to 2029 uh, 20, when Star Trek was blown? So I, mean, mm -hmm. I say I'm almost joking. I was just saying, it's interesting because you're talking about the verb trust and you're talking about the noun trust and I'm yeah. interested in the relationship between yeah. those two. I, when, when, you, when you use the word it's trust, really you're, you're almost talking about I mean, yeah. some yeah. kind of institution and when you're using it, you're talking about the relationship <coughs> yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious about how that all fits together. Well, that's, that's a perfect uh, segue into what, what's needed, it seems to me, because um, at least one of the areas that brings the multitude into um, the area of the trust and that provides a, a transition is to, is to talk about human trust um, and recapture it. Um, the, you know, again, the, 
Whereas the, the market is supposed to be trust among strangers. That's supposed to be the genius of the market. Uh, the, the social contract of the state is supposed to be a trust between government and uh, people. And that's, and both of those are broken down because uh, of the dysfunction of, of both the state and the market. So, so it is about human trust and it's about human collaboration that builds that trust. And th that trust is really essential to restore. The potentials for, um, for financing those trusts are at each, of the, each level. And so we're really looking at different scales now. And that makes it all the more vital that we're not using the frame of reference of the old monetary system to finance all this stuff. Because if we try to do that, if we race ahead and try to create all this without keeping our eye on the fact that a new monetary system is going to be necessary, in fact, it will become imperative because um, the present system is breaking down. I was at the G20 finance ministers meeting three weeks ago, and the conversation is, what do we do when the economy breaks down, when the monetary system breaks down? That's the number one question that they're talking about behind closed doors. And they know it. We should know it. A lot of people do know it. So who is really anticipating where this is all going to go at that, over that period of time? And for me, that's the ultimate feedback mechanism. It's not the, the financial one, but it's the monetary one. And then because it's the monetary one that leads into the meaning of the financial one, because the, the finance system is going to be, if it's still uh, based on, uh, on conventional money, it's still going to be at the mercy of the, all the volatility in the monetary system and all the turbulence in the age of austerity. That's what, that's what we're going to be uh, seeing for the next several years. Of course, it's, it, the age of austerity is, is inspiring people to move into crowdfunding and, crowd, and crowdsourcing type models. But at the same time, um, the, the, the opportunities of utilizing this really from a maximum kind of um, potentiality are limited as long as we're still using the conventional money. So what I'm saying is we need to be able to model a new kind of car currency and not really the cur alternative currencies that are being talked about now. I, I think they're a, a very primitive uh, means of, of projecting um, what's possible into the future. They're a good start, but th there's a long way to go. We've got to be able to model a kind of alternative currency system along with the conventional system so that when the conventional system breaks down, we've got this other thing operating here. When I was in um, Detroit uh, looking at Ford, uh, the Ford Museum. And I think Ford's a very interesting moment in history because I went and saw all his Model A Fords all the way from Model T. And then you start to look at well, up beyond Model T Fords and you start to see something beautiful and interesting had happened. So the car, and I think it's very interesting, you, you know when uh, he was creating the Ford cars, he had a turnaround rate. People were leaving every, I think it was 50% in every, every week. So people would, because the task was, he would say, you need to bang this hammer. That's all you have to do. Repeated action of the same thing. And he found that people would leave because people were used to a craft economy. They weren't used to a single transaction economy. And what he did was he said, I'm going to raise wages. So he gave incredible wage rise. Like, I think it was nearly 40%. Huge wage rise. And people stayed. And then if you watch the cars a few years later, you see cars coming forward that are styled. And you see advertising is happening. These cars now are symbolic symbols. And the theory I'd say is that as work became less and less meaningful, actually consumption was the process of validation. So we actually use consumption as a process to validate ourselves as opposed to the work. And if we're going to actually return to any meaningful relationship, we have to revalidate work at actually being a meaningful exercise for people rather than just a transactional exercise. So for me, you just have to look at the Ford history and the kind of changing relationship with work. And I think work should be, we should move from, I mean, I, I sort of tweeted yesterday that there's three models. There's debt fuel growth, there's weight, wage fuel growth, and there's equity fuel growth. And I think we've been living in a debt fuel growth for the last 20 years. Wages have been stagnant in America, in the UK. You take a largely stagnant. And then the last thing is actually equity field, ownership-based growth. We have meaningful interactions. So you have to change the economy of work to unleash the real productive crowd and the idea of the commons for me. Because the commons is actually based from the idea of the production rather than consumption relationship. Uh, to be honest, I, I think we're in a remarkable tipping point. Like I, think, I genuinely believe we have most, so the visions were all there in the 60s. 
We just didn't have the technologies. And now we have the technology the infrastructure to pretty much deliver most of the stuff that's possible. I think the big challenge for us is we will be building platforms, this institutional challenge. So, you know, revising GDP. You know, I, and I, okay, I want what, uh, GDP to different metrics, and I already see some of that stuff up there. But I also would be worth saying, really powerful corporates are already thinking like this. So really powerful corporates, I can name one or two. Uh, one in India, for example, that is a, a big, uh, like a mini Tata, is starting to see itself as an ecosystem. Uh, and they're building an ecosystem in a geography. They are, and there's questions about their governance, but they're starting to see themselves as trusts. So ecosystems for profit or ecosystem for return on capital are going to become more and more uh, evident. That's how businesses start to see the future of the world. I, if you just Google the word ecosystems for profit and you see the, the kind of reader route, it's now starting to turn up because actually business is starting to see it's going to operate that way. So I think we are an absolute tipping point in this conversation. And for me, what's intriguing is that actually one what I find really amazing is the kind of um, the kind of diversity of the people here, the age diversity, and how we're starting to connect all across this stuff. This is really profound for me. And I think, you know, I, I'm amazed at the amount of data people that are thinking like this as well. There's a lot of different alternative economic models that are being talked about right now. We think from, I don't even want to mention the word happiness model, but just to say, you know, this is a lot of stuff going on right now. And like, what is it in your experience and working with this as the school of commenting that, um, why the commons versus another model? And related to that, um, in terms of language use, like how important do you think it is that as we strive to build these new economic systems that people have a shared sense of a shared framework and a shared use of the board commons. And how much can they be using whatever kind of other related things are kind of related but not exactly the same thing. Does that question make sense? For me, happiness is just a, a, a tactic. So it's not a model, it's just a tactic. It's a talent. Uh, I'm sorry? It's a talent. Yeah, but happiness index is, I assume, what you're referring to, the beat at uh, Baton, and it's just a tactic. Uh, it's not a fundamental shift in the ownership, uh, structuring, value, investment infrastructure, which is where the commons is, is a kind of an alternative, structurally economic different uh, model. And I think we've got to be careful, of, and that's what I was trying to refer to about sharing economy and the appropriation of words and languages to give them equivalents when they have no equivalents. So I think there's a little bit of smartness required by the holders of the debate to make sure words are of equivalence mag or have equivalence magnitude. Happiness, I'm, I, I, I can talk offline about that, but I'm not a fan. I don't want to yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think they're not equivalents. I think uh, they're not of equivalent magnitude or, or model type. Uh, the commons is a philosophical and structural model, of, and the subset of it is IPSs and different models, trusts, and other forms of organization. But it's a much more powerful economic. Uh, it's a model that understands holism and completeness as we reach the edge of our finance system. That's why it's the most powerful model. Because I think for the last 30 years, we, we were able to maintain an illusion of infiniteness in our current system. And as that finite starts to encroach in, actually finance or resource finance starts to encroach in, actually the commons becomes a very powerful dominant model. And it's an automatic transition. I don't think we'll have a choice. It'll evolve. But Yeah. I concur. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to evolve new metrics. Yeah. And uh, they can include happiness, but in quality of life and well-being and sustainability and you know, we in, those metrics are still evolving, and uh, and it remains to be seen how sustainability truly will be measured because it certainly won't be measured through uh, the marketplace as it has been uh, recently through models like natural capitalism and, and ecological uh, uh, environmentalism in this era, uh, economic environmentalism, or rather environmental economics. Let's put it that way. Um, I think those are really primitive tools so far, and they are, carry the, the old system into the new kind of modeling. And I don't think we've really made the breakthrough into the, to the new system, because when the new metrics for the commons evolve, um, they're going to be so um, convincing, it seems to me, that, um, that it will make the model really come into place and make it very sensible. But I think what we're doing now is we're encouraging people to continue to work on those metrics. And lots of people are doing it in institutions all over the world and in 
in, in, in corporate settings, in R&D, everywhere. I mean, there are a lot of people are giving this a lot of thought. But what we have the advantage, this group and others like us, is that, is that we, we recognize that <coughs> it's got to be new and it's got to express something on its own terms rather than have the carryover from the market system into the new model. And f by that I mean we can't be monetizing ecosystems and expect to get results that are sustainable. We can't use the metrics of, of trying to value equity, at least at the, at the first stage of valuing equi equity. We've got to create an independent me um, a metric that is not monetized, that, that has an independent kind of value and an independent form of expression. So. Uh, I don't know what that metric looks like. I know people that are working on it, and, I, and, and it's going forward very quickly. But, but we've got to be able to talk about the preservation of value of resources completely independent of the marketplace. And when we get that, then we can begin to talk about freeing up the resources under the, some of the resources under the cap to be able to inject back into the marketplace. That's when we've really got something going. And that's where we distinguish ourselves now as, a, as a, a, a real meaningful commons movement, because when we get to that point, we've you know we can really make huge, profound changes.